All right, open your Bibles, if you will, to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Remember last week we began kind of talking about the introduction of 1 Timothy. And uh, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus are what is called the uh, pastoral epistles or the pastoral letters. The Apostle Paul wrote these letters to these two young men that were overseers in the churches Uh, Titus was in Crete, and uh, Timothy was left at Ephesus by the Apostle Paul, and we're going to see this morning one of the reasons why he left him there. Um, Timothy was a young man, and uh, uh, as we go through this study, we'll see that he had some physical issues and was probably a a, a timid man, but Paul wrote to Timothy to instruct him and to encourage him Mm -hmm and to help him to oversee this church in Ephesus. Um, when uh, Pastor Mick yesterday was talking, uh, was teaching from uh, the book of Acts, I want to just kind of go back and reiterate just a couple of verses. He uh, talked about from Acts chapter 20, and uh, I just want to go back and read, uh, starting with verse 29. And remember, the Apostle Paul was uh, had left uh, uh, Ephesus, meet was meeting at uh, at uh, Miletus or at uh, um, yeah at Miletus, and called the elders of the church of Ephesus to him to give him give them his farewell speech as Pastor Mick so well uh, instructed us yesterday, but he said this in verse twenty nine. He said, "I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you." not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. He said, therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish every one of you with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. And so Paul, as he was leaving Ephesus, charged the leaders of the church, and he said, listen, I know that after I'm gone, there are going to be some fierce wolves that come in. These fierce wolves that he was talking about, and he even said, they're going to come, they're going to arise from amongst yourselves. And these fierce wolves that he's talking about are false teachers. And so as he was addressing the leaders in Miletus, and he left. Now when we get to 1 Timothy, those false teachers were there. Paul said, they're coming. He says to Timothy, they're here. And so he gives instruction to young Timothy on this situation. Um, Dr. Henry Waiters wrote on the uh, topic of sound doctrine. He said this, He said, too many believe that it does not matter what one believes, so long as they are sincere. He said, doctrine affects our life. Truth leads to life in God, error to death and destruction. He said, today, many have closed their ears to truth and failed to realize that they cannot remain innocent before God. The doctrines of men are the prevailing doctrines almost everywhere. Doctrine is important, amen? And doctrine is simply teaching. It's, it's, it's what we're learning. Um, it is important. T. DeWitt Talmadge said this. He said, there is but one standard of everlastingly right and wrong, and that is the Bible. Correctly understanding what God says is of the utmost importance. Doctrine is important. The Apostle Paul wrote in the uh, letter to the Ephesian church that we must be aware of, uh, of doctrines. He says in, in, verse, or in chapter 4, he says, So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. He said, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way, into him who is the head, into Christ. Doctrine is 
important. I remember one year, several years ago, I was um, in a meeting of this organization. Um, Christian men were getting together. And uh, one of the leaders of this organization, as he began the meeting, he made this statement. He said, leave your doctrine at the door. And I don't know if I heard anything else after that. I'm thinking, leave your doctrine at the door? I don't need to be here then. I, I mean, just invite everybody then. Just invite anybody and everything in. Doctrine is important. It does matter. Sound doctrine is important because our faith is based on a specific message. Sound doctrine is important because the gospel is a sacred trust, and we dare not tamper with God's communication to the world. Sound doctrine is important because what we believe affects how we live. Sound doctrine is important because we must determine truth in a world of falsehood. I don't know if you watch any news or not, um, but it's, it's really hard to get truth these days, right? When you turn on the news, man, it's, you have to wade through all of this stuff to really get to the truth of what's going on. Sound doctrine is important. False teachers are busy trying to capture Christians. There were teachers of false doctrine in Paul's day, just as there are in our day. And we must, we must, we must take them seriously. We're so blessed. You know, I was thinking about how, how blessed we are being able to be here every morning, Monday through Friday and every afternoon, and opening up the Word of God together and being instructed in the Word, being taught in the Word being taught the right, correct way. Listen, God says what he means, and he means what he says. I, I've, I've been in so-called Bible studies before where somebody who is, you know, supposedly leading the study will open up the Bible, read a passage of Scripture, and say, now what does that say to you? Oh, that's scary. No, it's not what does that say to you. It's what does that say? What is God saying? And so as we open up this letter to Timothy that was written by the Apostle Paul, we're going to hear what God said through the Apostle Paul. And so let's look at verses uh, chapter 1, and let's look at verses uh, 3 through 7. Paul says, As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus, so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine." nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than steward the stewardship from God that is by faith. He said, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussions, desiring to be teachers of the law, without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. And so Paul is writing here to young Timothy, and he's reminding him why he left him there at Ephesus. One of the reasons that Paul left Timothy at Ephesus was to deal with the false teaching that was going on, that was that was into the church, that was corrupting the minds of the believers in the church in Ephesus. Now, he doesn't give us enough information here to know specifically what the false teaching was, but he does use a, a, a military language to help Timothy see the seriousness of, uh, of this problem. He used this word charge. And this word charge, uh, it's a military term, and it really means to give strict orders from a superior officer. Paul used this word, and in other translations, it's sometimes translated uh, command or commandment. He uses this word eight times in his two letters to Timothy. And so Paul is commanding or charging under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, young Timothy, to deal with 
these false teachers that had infiltrated the church. We're called upon today to do the same thing. We're called upon today to, uh, to, to, to deal with the false teaching that's out there. You know, uh, there, there are a lot of things. People open up the Bible and they read it and, and, and they start saying things. And I'm like, where do you get that from that? And they really make it say what they want it to say, and that's dangerous, and it's heresy. And so Paul uses this military language to to charge Timothy to deal with this issue. He, He was conveying the message to Timothy, listen, you are a soldier of Christ under the orders of King Jesus, and now pass these orders on to the soldiers in your church. And so what was the charge? Not to teach any different doctrine, different than what Paul had spoken, different from what Paul had taught. Remember, Paul spent three years with them. He says in back in, in Acts chapter 20, through night and day, through tears, he was admonishing them. And so Paul charges Timothy to tell these guys not to teach any different doctrine other than that was taught by the Apostle Paul, and not to devote themselves to myths or to endless genealogies. You think about this. God had given Paul the word, and Paul had then entrusted this word to Timothy. You think about the Apostle Paul, and you know uh, we read about his conversion experience in Acts chapter 9. And after Paul um, was blinded for three days... And then his eyes were opened up, and he spent some significant time in the desert with Jesus. You think about it, he went to the Jesus Seminary. He spent some significant time with Jesus and received the, the revelation from Jesus himself and was taught. And remember, he is a, a, a writer of the New Testament and, and wrote a large portion of the New Testament. And so Paul is under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so God had given Paul the word, and then Paul entrusted this word to Timothy as well. And now it was Timothy's responsibility to guard it. We'll read that in 2 Timothy. And then to pass it along to faithful men. Again, he writes this in 2 Timothy. Now, this idea of myths and endless genealogies, myths uh, are beliefs that are untrue and are deceptive, which are, in fact, dangerous and deadly. When we're opening up the Word of God, you know, James tells us that not many of us should want to be teachers because those of us that teach are judged with a harsher, a stricter judgment. It's a scary thing when you think about you know, we're, we're opening up the Word of God and, and teaching the Word of God. That's serious business. And there are guys that open up the Bible and just say whatever they want to say about it and make it say what they want it to say. And that's dangerous and it's deadly. You think about <clears throat> Jesus Christ, who is the very Son of God, the sinless Son of God, left heaven, came to the earth, became one of us. We're getting ready to celebrate this event, right? What is Christmas? Christmas is about God becoming a man. Jesus left heaven, came to the earth, put on flesh, became one of us, grew up as a man, lived a perfect sinless life so that he could go to the cross and die in our place. He died a substitutionary death. I heard one guy the other day say it this way. Jesus not only died for us, he died as us. Jesus died in my place. He paid my penalty. I have sinned against a holy and righteous God. My heart is wicked. And there's no hope outside of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And people need to know that. And false teaching doesn't say that. There's a lot of teaching that's out there today, and in Paul's day, oh, you're a good person, you're okay, you're going to be all right. No, we're not. The Bible says contrary to that, there is nobody that's good, not even one. Nobody seeks after God. 
We need salvation, and Jesus is the only way to have salvation. We have to have right, pure, correct doctrine, not myths. And these endless genealogies, these false teachers were, were using Old Testament law, especially the genealogies uh, from the Old Testament, to manufacture all kinds of things to lead people astray. And remember, the, the goal of these false teachers was to lead them astray, away from the truth, and to follow after them. And we see that happening all the time. Instead of producing love, purity, and a good conscience and a sincere faith, these dangerous doctrines were causing division. They were causing hypocrisy, and they were causing all kinds of problems in the church. John MacArthur said something like this. Sound doctrine produces holy living. Sound doctrine produces holy living. If we don't understand what God says in his word and what he expects of his people, listen, this is not a set of rules and a set of do's and don'ts, but this is instruction for life. And if we're not following, and if we don't know the instruction, we're not going to follow it. And if we're not following the instruction that God has laid out for us, we're in serious trouble. He says in verse 6, certain persons by swerving from these have wandered away into vain discussion. Uh, remember what Paul had told the leaders in Ephesus, or in Miletus? That they were going to arise from amongst yourselves. That's what he's talking about here. There, these, these people have swerved away from the truth. And have wandered into these vain discussions. And Paul's concern is to stop the harmful drift which leads to false teaching, which leads to incorrect understanding, which leads to wrong living. You know, you turn on the TV and I was just saying I was, I was watching something last night on one of the Christian channels. And, and I would say probably a good a high percentage of time, anytime you turn on Christian TV today, you're not going to hear about sin. You're not going to hear about, you know, that, that we're condemned to hell outside of the grace of God. You're not going to hear that, uh, that we're headed for hell unless Jesus intercepts and saves us. But you're going to hear, oh, you're a good person. You're wonderful. You're great. You are, and see, what they're doing is they elevate man and bring God down. And that's dangerous. And that's deadly. Paul says in verse 7 here, desiring these, these, these men, desiring to be teachers of the law, they don't have an understanding what they're even saying. And I think about that all the time. I think about it as I'm, as I'm listening to you know, some of these guys that are spewing this garbage that are out there. And, and that's out there, I'm thinking... Don't they hear themselves? I mean, do they, 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 they really can't believe this. If they really believe this, if they really understood this, they, they wouldn't be spewing that stuff that's out there. They don't have a good grasp on the scriptures themselves. Now listen, I'm in no way saying that look, I've got, I got all this down. I, listen, I, I'm an expert in this. No, 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 no. Absolutely not. I'm learning and growing every day. And like I said, we are blessed to be here, to be able to do this so that we can learn, so that we can grow deeper in our understanding and our knowledge of the scripture and growing in our, in our relationship with the Lord. But these guys, they don't have a good grasp on scripture themselves and they want to teach others and they want others to think that they know what they're talking about. And people were following after them. They were doing this in the church of Ephesus. And that's why Paul was writing this to Timothy to correct this. And they're doing it today. They didn't understand the content or the purpose of God's law. And we'll get into that next time. They were, in fact, leading people out of the freedom of grace in Christ and actually leading them into the bondage of legalism. 
Anytime we start thinking that, uh, that I can do something and get in God's good graces, I'm in trouble. I mean, think about it. We are sinful human beings. Jeremiah tells us that our hearts, the human heart, is wicked, desperately wicked. And so how is it that we can think that we can do anything to please a holy and righteous God? We can't. That's why Jesus came. Jesus, the perfect, perfect sinless son of God, came down so that we can be made right with God. Let me just leave you with this. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I love this verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's the gospel in a nutshell. Listen, for our sake, who's our? Sinners. For sinners' sake, that's all of us. Paul says in Romans 3, listen, we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Nobody's exempt from that. For our sake, he, God the Father, made him, God the Son, to be sin. That, it doesn't mean that he, he became sin, but it means that he was treated as if he had committed every sin that had ever been committed. The wrath of Almighty God was poured out on Jesus Christ, the sinless Son of God, in our place, so that... In him, in Christ, we sinners might become the righteousness of God. It's called imputation. He took our sin or took our punishment for our sin and gave us his righteousness. And through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we are righteous in God's sight. We are declared not guilty in God's sight, not because of anything that we've done, but because of what he did. He died as us, and we need to declare that. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father, once again, we thank you. Lord, again, there, there's just no way that we can say enough to thank you for what you've done in Christ. Thank you, God, that you have given us a your word that we can read and study and learn and grow and know what you say and know correct doctrine. Lord, help us. Help us, Lord, that as we study your word, that your Holy Spirit would give us understanding, Lord, that we would be able to know what you say and then do what you say. And Father, we'll be sure to give you the praise in Jesus' name.